today in history in 1946, Donald Trump, former New York real estate mogul and 45th president of the United States, was unfortunately born. Welcome to What the Fuck History, where we discuss the wackiest and weirdest things that make us say, well, what the fuck history. I am your connection, Zachary Tushus, and if you need to get some dirty business done, well, I'm your guy. My name is Megan, and you know what they say, everything's bigger in Texas, and I'm about to tell you a story later on that proves that that might be true. And I'm Matt, back at it again with the white vans, and today I learned a whole bunch of crab facts, so fucking sit down and shut up while I say a few. Crab Crab facts, I don't have them, thank fuck. There are over 6,700 species of crab. Second, the Japanese spider crab crab is the world's largest crab, measuring 12 to 13 feet across. Among the world's smallest crabs are pea crabs, which are known to be 0.4 to 0.6 inches in diameter. A group of crabs is called a cast. Crabs can walk in all directions, but mostly walk and run sideways. Crabs are decapods, meaning that they have 10 legs. Female crabs can release 1,000 to 2,000 eggs at once. And the lifespan of small crabs averages around three to four years, but larger species, uh, such as the giant spider crab, can live as long as 100 years. And in the ocean, all things return to crab. That's true. They do. Crabs, they do. crabs, crabs. Praise the crab. Crab people. Crab, crab, crab. Have you seen? Um, have you seen coconut crabs? Crab. What? Coconut crabs. Coconut crabs. Yeah. Coconut They're crabs. Bonkers. They're so, so named because they can crack open coconuts. So, oh um, you know, Bikini Atoll, where they let off uh, the the hydrogen bomb. Yes, indeed. The yes. test. Um, yeah, so all the coconut crabs, because they eat the coconuts, and they uh, those collect the radiation, uh-huh. um, all of the coconut crabs are uh, radioactive. Yeah, they're all So what radioactive. you're telling me is, I could go to this beach and get pinched by a radioactive crab yeah. and turn into the crab man? You could yes. become crab man, is what I'm I could become you. crab man? Yeah, I mean, it's not a confirmed right. fact, but, like, I, you know, everything that I've watched in, in media does lead me to believe that you could become Crab Man if you go Coconut to Coconut crabs Apple. are also gigantic. They oh are my gosh. huge. Who's that? that? Scuttling to the rescue. <laughs> Why? Scuttling. It's Crab Man. Zach, Scuttling I'm to the gonna rescue. post in the general notes section of our Discord to show you what a coconut crab is. Yeah, looks. they're really, really okay. big, Zach. They're beef boys. Holy yeah, fuck. Yeah, yeah they're That's a giant. big fucking crab. They're it's not... A- they're not little babies. Big I mean, crab. that's not going to be a fun pinch, but if it gives me the powers of the crab, yeah, might be worth it. Might be worth it. All right, children, gather around. The wait, ancient... I have one more crab no. story. No, no, wait, no. It <laughs> Dad was, it was, was getting really... ready to start the podcast. I'm sorry, but there was this one video I watched of these drunk boys, and uh-huh. they were looking at a crab, and they and tried to hand them. it a fi- no. They they handed it a five dollar bill, and mm-hmm. the crab grabbed it like crabs are wont to do and they're just like thank you for spending time with us and the crab ran away with the five dollars <laughs> that's and some I, worthy crab time that I know, is dude. good crab time all right children gather around the ancient game of rock paper scissors has been played and the order for tonight is me followed by zach followed by megan yes Whee! is everyone okay with that we are so ready I just want to point out that you did use the Uber Uno reverse card. I did use the Uber Uno reverse card. Which we, basically says, fuck you, I make the rules. We played a game of rock, paper, scissors. I was not going first. And I flipped the table, and then I flipped it back. And everything was right with the universe again. I came in with a lot of steam tonight, and it's because I'm ready. I'm I can ready. tell. So, I'm like a game first. of Monopoly, you flipped the table and then put it back. And then I put it back very nicely. Uh, so listen here, kids. Last week I did a story about my second favorite of the World Wars, the prequel, World War I. This week I am doing a story about my favorite of the World Wars. That's right, baby. Dad is back on his recliner to tell you about a story from good old WW2. WW2. I know I'm the one with the mustache on this podcast, Uh but I feel like you need a dad mustache there, I mean, I do have a beard. That is true. I will take it. And the mustache to go with it. 
Well, yeah. I mean, I'd be a little, I don't know, just the mustache. I mean, just the beard might be like, I don't know. But, like, yeah, you do have the mustache. I like it. Never mind. I, I concede. So, it was the year of our Lord, 1942, and Hitler is making his way through most of Europe and eventually ends up taking over tons of places. If you don't know what places Hitler took over, fucking go back to high school history. That's or not look what at we're map. here for. And ultimately, it doesn't matter much to my story. So, go get your father a beer. Yeah, go get him a beer. Yeah, get me a beer, son. Uh, I'll tell your cousins this story. Eventually, <laughs> eventually, you've already heard it. <laughs> eventually, the German forces make their way to uh, Kiev in Ukraine, mm-hmm. and uh, they declare themselves to be the rulers of Kiev. But the major general in charge concludes that these people are not going to be easy to control because there are so many of them, and uh-huh. he very quickly decides that he needs to come up with a way to entertain the people of Kiev, Ukraine. Okay. I, I like I like the entertainment aspect. Uh-huh, I also uh-huh. like the fact that uh, we're talking about uh, a country uh, that has, quite frankly, apparently is about to show us how they just didn't give a fuck and were, like, giving middle fingers to the enemy every time in World War II, and uh-huh. they're still doing that to this yeah, day, and I'm never just stopped. very happy. Yeah, now they that never we're... back down from a fight, and I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, now that we're in World War Three, the people of Kiev are still, still fucking it up. Just... Is it Kiev or Kiev? I don't... I... God only knows, and I've said it both ways, so now... You know what? Tomato, tomato. I say Kiev, tomato, you say tomato. Kiev. He says the same thing. <laughs> tomato, tomato. Tomato, tomato. Um, so anyways, uh, Major General Eberhardt uh, was Eberhardt. the name of the gentleman, and his way of entertaining people was not the ancient Roman way of entertaining people with gladiatorial fighting, but it was with the good old-fashioned game of soccer. Okay. Um, See, or, you said ancient Roman, and I thought wine and orgies, but well, gladiatorial yeah, combat also worked. This is also true, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a good story if it had to do with Nazis and orgies. That's um, true. I don't, what I don't know, dude. Did you just no, hear what you said? Megan, Megan. What? It would be a good story, but the Nazis don't deserve the, the orgies. The Nazis don't That's deserve the, the orgies. Right. I'm sorry. Um, right. I will I say. Was it thinking? That there are conflicting reports about exactly how everything went down, and I have done my best research, uh, done my best to research this story between coming home from work and hitting uh, the record button tonight, but as always, do not get mad at me if my facts are wrong, I will cry. I, I am not afraid to shed tears. I am not afraid to shed tears if you are <laughs> the least bit angry at me for getting my facts Just wrong. Just a macro amount of... A micro amount of a, a anger, micro amount of, uh, and I will burst into tears. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely not afraid to turn the waterworks full on, uh, because you said that my facts were wrong, and maybe they are, and maybe I don't give a fuck. Um, so Eberhardt decides to pit a German team against a team of Ukrainian soccer players that was called. The Ukrainian Champions Dynamo Kiev. Yes. UCDK, got it. He yeah. You said so many words. I did. Would you like me to re say them? Yeah, could you could you repeat? Okay, all I'll of do those it. Words. I'll do it and I'll sound like Brian from Texas. Please. Ukrainian. Ukrainian. Champions. Champions. Dynamo. Dynamo. Kiev. Who had been spared from death by a German officer who was saving people who were, quote unquote, somewhat important. Somewhat. Hell yeah. Only somewhat important. Yeah. They have dynamo in their name. They have to be important. They have I'm going to be important. start describing the crimson dynamo. things like that in general. Like, yeah, that they're, I don't they know. have somewhat importance. Yeah, somewhat. I would imagine <laughs> that, like,. Anything could have somewhat importance, depending on what lens you're looking at it through. That's true, but like yeah. it would be funny if it's like uh, if you start applying like the modifier somewhat to like other things where it shouldn't be. Like I somewhat love you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess See, I like, I guess I kind of love you. All I can yeah. think of is fucking what is the show? Um, Young Justice, and like the first season where Robin's like. 
why is everyone perturbed? Why can't you just be turbed? You know? <laughs> Jeez. Uh, you know what else is interesting is that the opposite of disgruntled is just to be gruntled. <laughs> so in the first match, as essentially Dynamo Kiev are pitted against teams in Germany. And their first match... Uh, against Kiev versus Germany, uh, the Dynamo were leading one to nothing at halftime, and were approached during halftime and given a stern talking to, which basically amounted to, um, "If you don't let the German team win, we are going to kill you all." Man. Uh, well, that's so shitty. So the Dynamo Kiev came back out onto the pitch and finished the game at four to one. With them being the victors. Good. I'm glad that they weren't <laughs> cowed by anyone ever. They very much in the vein of like Dread Pirate Roberts in The Princess Bride. Uh, the Ukrainian team is not killed for winning 4-1 to one against the German team. But they are essentially told that if they don't lose the next game, they will be killed. So it's like, you did very good today, Wesley. I mo- I'll most likely kill you in the kill morning. Kill you in the morning. Good work. Most likely get some sleep. Yeah. Good, most likely kill you in the morning. Most likely kill you in the morning. Except this, it was like, all right, fair played, fair played. Good game, good game. Most likely kill you on the next one. <laughs> good game. Get some sleep. Most likely kill you in the morning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the Dynamo Kiev are told that they will be killed if they fail to lose again. So basically, if they win, they're they're gonna die. And the Germans keep making new teams to go up against. They're like, how about these guys? The Ukrainian champions, Dynamo Kiev, and they keep fucking winning. <laughs> and these guys just this can't is, be beat. This is why I'm saying that it was very much like the uh, the Dread Pirate Roberts because after each win. They're being told that they'll die if they keep winning. Now, this is where the conflicting reports come in, because in some of my research, it was said that, like, it was very much like these were prisoners in a camp and they were playing against the Nazi officers. Then there were some that were saying that there were, like, dogs in the stands ready to rip the players apart if they... If they won, there were also reports that, like, there were SS officers that were, like, taking shots at the players while they were scoring goals or just after they had scored goals and shit That's like this. That's, like, even so, more impressive, like, if they were having... Well, yeah, if, if any of that was true, goals. it would be it would be super impressive. I was about like, to say, I feel like they originally were like, we're going to call your bluff, yeah. and then someone starts taking shots and they're like, well, fucking try, I dare you. Yeah, none of that is really confirmed, not really written about, but there are some people that, you know, like to Procopius the situation, so... But anyways, on August 6th, in the year of our Lord 1942, the Dynamo Kiev are put up against the best team that the Luftwaffe has to offer. Also, side note, Luftwaffe is a very funny word. That is a good name. <laughs> um, but, they're, but they're put up against a team called uh, Flakelf. Mm, uh, Steve, for when you're listening to this, it's spelled F L A. K E L F. I don't know if that means anything in German. So, like, if you could let me know, that'd be great. Okay, um, but why weren't they the Dynamo Flakelf? It's a great question as to why they weren't the Dynamo Flakelf, but uh, probably because they weren't Ukrainian. That's true. Only Ukrainians can use the word Dynamo. It's like a law. So they're ah. warned once again that they're not allowed to win or they'll be killed. And the Dynamo Kiev won. Three to two, and went back to their locker room fully expecting to die. They hung their heads. They were like, "Well, you know, not a bad was, way to die if we have to die." It was a good die. run, lads. It was a good yeah. run, lads. We got on the field. We were like, "Let's lose the game," but the spirit of the game took over, and we had to win. And we just had to win. It wasn't yeah, allowed like, for us to lose. It's not our fault that we're blessed with like the god's strength, but you know, it's just what happens when you're yeah. brain. Also, according to like the reports of this, they were given less rations and no time to train between these matches. So, like. Yeah. 
essentially every time they won, their rations were cut and they were like they were obviously not allowed to train the entire time that they like they weren't allowed to practice. So each time they were going into a game with like fresh legs, no practice under their belt. But they had been, you know, good soccer players to begin with. So obviously. what you're saying is that the Germans were like, we'll kill you if you win. And they tried, but very, very slowly by very, starving very them. Very slowly, for sure. So. <laughs> like, we'll get you. Interestingly enough, they're not killed after beating the Flakelf 3-2-2. Two, two. Instead, that they're, they're, they're informed. Sorry, I stumbled over that whole sentence. They're informed that they're going to be set up to play again in three days' time against an even tougher German team called Rook, which is spelled, again, R-U-K-H. Steve, just tell me how I was supposed to say that. And what it means, if it means anything. We gotta get this. We gotta get this guy on the payroll. The Dynamo Kiev know for a fact that this is their last chance to survive. They are told more times than usual <laughs> that they will be killed if they do not lose. Um, they are told that you know if they win this game, they will be killed and tortured. That they might never see their families again. Uh, and so. Facing the um, insurmountable uh, challenge of deciding whether or not to live or die, they went out and they beat the Germans eight to nothing. (laughs) 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 Fuck. Maybe the Germans, maybe football just isn't. Maybe football just isn't their sport, for sure. Maybe they should try something different. They should, probably. So, essentially, what happens is they, they win. They win the game eight to nothing. The Gestapo ends up, or if you know, you're Marjorie Taylor Greene, the Gazpacho. Uh, came and That's round true. up the yep. the players. Uh, from my research, I believe two to three of them were killed instantly. Um, and then the remainder of the team were sent to concentration camps to uh, be tortured and killed slowly. But again, I did not do like a shitload of research into what happened to the team after this event, but I do know that um, I believe a good number of them did perish, unfortunately. That yeah, is unfortunate. They, but the way that the games, Ukrainians though. looked at it, essentially, was that they could help their people get through the war with their hel- heads held high in this regard. So it was sort of just like they were the pride of their nation at this point, and they could boost everyone else's spirits and let them know that even when things looked bleak against the Germans, um, you're still able to stand up and be proud of who you are. So, just like today. And I think that that's amazing. I also think it's amazing. And I think it's, yeah, Megan's got a good point that it is a lot like today. Um, so I like hearing stories about, like the ukrainians continuous like uh you know fuck you to the russians and i saw that um they did like this online thing where they're like hey send us a message online people and we'll write whatever you want on the munitions that we shoot at russian soldiers (laughs) and then it showed like the missiles they had on the ground with like nani written on it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and like someone's twitter handle and i was like honestly this is horrible but like the russians came into their house yeah, yeah. no for sure like, i don't know can... i feel like everything in ukraine is just like why don't we become the goddamn batman like all of them are just like fuck everything i'm gonna do it this entire soccer team is just like as a man i'm flesh and blood i can be ignored i can be destroyed but as a symbol as a symbol, I can be incorruptible and everlasting. Yeah, it's this, like, was, that, yeah. this was basically the V for Vendetta of soccer teams. <laughs> Voila, yeah. and view a humble Be- Bulgarian veteran. <laughs> Behind this mask is an idea, and ideas are bulletproof. That's true. Oh, I love it. I love it. That was a I good think one, that that's though. fantastic. I think, it was very, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it was like a, a very like pertinent story to, you know, 
the war that is still happening. Yeah. Yeah. World War Three. Again, you know, different different bad guys, different directors, some of the same, same players. Movie. I, I again I think that it's also just like it's a good it's not a feel good story. It has a bad ending, but it has like a cathartic ending. Like these people were like, We're gonna die, so we're just gonna fucking go out with a bang and Yeah. If we have to go out with a bang ten times, let's really make it bigger and better every fucking time. Well like, I just yeah, I just thought that it was really interesting that like at every turn the Germans are like, We're gonna kill you and the Ukrainians were just like Okay, when though? Do it, you fucking cowards. Yeah. yeah so like it's when, it's though. like every time they won at soccer, they were just like, is this it? Is this the one? And they were like, <laughs> is... no, we'll give you one more chance to lose. Are we there yet? Are we there well... yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> we'll give you one more chance to make the right decision. <sighs> so anyways. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. It was a good story, Matt. Thanks. He's but like, I'm going to steal you. the talking stick. Okay. It's mine now. All right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and first off, let me just call out the fact that uh, as much as my intro was a mob joke, uh, it was also a me joke because I covet the place of Dirty Boy on this podcast, as you all well know. Mm-hmm. Yes, we do. Um, we, and by we, I mean me, went to make some art of our faces yesterday. If you haven't seen it on our Instagram, you should go fucking look. I know, fucking it's... use your eyeballs. I know this is oh, an audio Jesus. medium, but fucking use your... I'm sorry. I got angry. He's Everyone. going so hard. <laughs> it's yeah, been a day. What's happening? Anyway, so I digress. Angry. I'm sorry. I love you. I, do, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean <laughs> it. <laughs> but yeah, so I made some art and Megan was like, I only have spicy pictures when I asked for a picture of her face. It's true. I was, <laughs> I was like, okay, but remember, I'm the thirsty one on this show. Yeah, Despite he definitely all... did say that. Yeah. I, I was like, Megan, I appreciate it, but like, come on, give me I'm my s- thing. I'm sorry. I like sometimes the clock strikes midnight, and I'm like, well, time, time to, to get take dolled some up. spicy photos. Time to take yes. some spicy photos. All dolled photos. up and nowhere to go. All dolled up and exactly 1 a.m. <laughs> As some people are apt to do, it doesn't matter if it's 1 a.m. I'm an old man, so I go to bed early, but I still like spicy photos. Um, but yes, uh, and I was like, yeah, I'm the thirsty. One on the show, I'm the thirst trap of the show, despite us all being wildly sexy, because, like, trust me, listener, if this was a visual medium, you'd be drooling. That's uh, true. <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing I'm laughing at my own bullshit. He's literally Jeez. over here telling people that I don't look like Sasquatch's younger cousin. Stop Matt. it! <laughs> what? I just what a thing to call yourself! My fingers through your beard. Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, anyway, let's get down to business. To defeat the Huns. No, to enlist the mob. Oh. Oh. That's so, a different take on a classic. It is. I. It's the r- r- remix. <laughs> Never do that again. I don't plan on it, okay. but I probably will because my brain forgets things. Oh, See last episode. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> So, I am stealing a few grains of sand from Matt's sandbox, because gotta, I will be discussing... Out of there. <laughs> I know I do, but I'm going to be discussing some stuff from the Second World War. That's my favorite of the World Wars! I know, we're eating a double trouble of World War II bullshit tonight, apparently. Alright. However, Matt, don't worry too much, because it's stuff about the good old U.S. of A. rather than the European quarter, so I have at least only taken a few grains of sand and not the whole sandbox. Okay, I'll stay in my sandbox. I have not stormed the beaches of Matt's sandbox. Wow. (laughs) With a long bow and a claymore. (laughs) Ah, good old Mad Jack. So, this is going to be a quick amalgamation of a couple of stories that basically shows that the United States could not do anything without the fucking mob. Let's make our way back to the year 1942, where the SS Normandy, spelled N-O-R-M-A-N-D-I-E, this distinction there. Normandy! Um, Normandy! Normandy. Well, this, this lovely ship is, um... Well, it's set on fire in a near hilarious set of circumstances. Yes. I love hilarious fires. 
basically it was a luxury cruise liner that didn't really sell a lot of tickets so the united states government said "Ooh, we could use that to carry troops and they were like okay cool let's convert this giant luxury yacht into a troop carrier and as the ship workers are working on this a spark from a welding torch ends up kind of like jumping off and uh well i don't know how to put this other than the varnish that they used back in 1942 on wood was extremely flammable even while dry what else is new are we surprised no they painted their houses with lead yeah exactly so this this whole ship catches on fire because like, someone was like mm, can we put lots of flammable materials in wood varnish like these are the same people that were just like oh man asbestos <laughs> asbestos everywhere put it i we don't even know what mesophilioma is yet but like mm, our kids are gonna have to deal with this hardcore a uh, little small side note, there was a supervillain in the Fantastic Four rogues gallery called Asbestos Man. Stop. Yup. Stop. Stop. <laughs> he These had an asbestos people. net. I'm, I'm not going to lie, Zach. I'm just not surprised. I'm not surprised <laughs> that they had flammable wood varnish because uh, everything was flammable. Yes. This whole world's on fire. How about we're, my we're world's make... on fire? How about yours? But that's the way I like it because I never get bored. Oh, my God. <laughs> They're like, we're going to make um, the very building blocks of, of matter dangerous, too. Yeah. How about that? We did that, too. We did that, too. So the SS Normandy is set ablaze, and it burns to a sinking crisp in the New York Harbor. Uh, like how much emphasis I put on the P of crisp there. Uh, crisp. <laughs> crisp. <laughs> he punctuated it. So it sinks, and the United States government goes... It's gotta be Italian and German spies, right? Like, it can't be our own ineptitude. Like, we can't have human mistakes. We're goddamn Americans. It has to be sabotage, correct? Correct. But they weren't correct. They weren't correct. Uh, but it does lead Navy intelligence to literally run around and start squeezing all the dock workers, being like, are you a German spy? Are you an Italian spy? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us where the goddamn Italians are. Like, it's also New York, and it's a bunch of dock workers, so they're all like, hey, we're all fucking Italian. Hey. Hey, I'm walking here. But the issue with squeezing New York dock workers is that... Most people in New York, including the dock workers, ask you to buy them dinner first. No, but they don't <laughs> answer <laughs> fucking hell. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say it. I appreciate it. Um, always buy dinner first before you give someone a squeeze and make sure it's a consensual one. I digress. So the, re the problem is that the dock workers and 90% of New York does not answer to the United States government. They answer to one group of people and one group of people only. The mob. That's the Italian mob. Specifically, the Sicilian Italian mob, mostly at this time. So, everyone is super tight-lipped, and the investigation by the Navy intelligence into spies and sympathizers goes fuck all nowhere. To get more information, though, the United States government does the only smart play, well, one of the only smart plays in their history of fuck-ups, and they go to kiss the ring themselves. Mm. Navy mm. Intelligence contacts Meyer Lansky, who, along with our next guest, guest, Lucky Luciano, I have mentioned them before. What a... I, see the I, other podcast episode. I don't remember which one it is. <laughs> I would be so excited if Zach knew off the top of his head. Because, for two reasons. Listeners, this this is an in-bit between you and me. It would be funny if Zach could recall the episode where he spoke of these two gentlemen before. Because, one, it would mean that he has a really good memory. And, two, it would make the fact that he forgot I had already done a story that he was reporting on last week even funnier because it would mean that he has a good memory and he, he just fucked up but anyway sorry <laughs> zach go, go. <laughs> thanks <laughs> zach knows that i love him and this will be the last week that i give him shit for that particular issue it's all good um so they go to meyer lansky and are like hey we want your help trying to kind of figure this out can you get us in with lucky luciano 
And Meyer Lansky's like, eh, yeah, let me see what I can do. Also, good to note that Lansky was Polish Jewish, so I'm pretty sure the government felt comfortable asking him if they could talk to Luciano about fucking up the axes. Yeah. So Lansky gets them a meeting with Luciano, which is interesting for the sole fact that currently Lucky Luciano is doing 30 to 50 in Clinton prison for compulsory prostitution. So nice. <laughs> nice. Lucky Luciano is still fucking untouchable while being in jail. Love A this. Serious under undercount. So in order just to take the meeting, Luciano swings his swings his uh, big Italian dick around and gets mm-hmm. himself transferred to a prison that's literally right next to New York. Nice. <laughs> so he can have better connection to running his mob empire Listen, while being in jail. He he knows how to work remotely. <laughs> in these trying times, we all have to learn how to work remote. <laughs> we, yeah, we working use... remote for him was being in a prison that wasn't right next to New York. He might as well be, like, in the city if they moved him to a prison that was right there. Working remote without the fucking internet. Love it. He was raising pigeons like that one guy from Shawshank. Or, or John Wick. That too. Either way. But the government and Luciano end up coming to a deal after this meeting, and the Luciano's sentence is commuted, which ah. in layman terms, layman's terms, who for people who don't have a law degree or aren't like me and had the time to look it up, basically means that the sentence is substituted for a sentence for a lesser crime. So his sentence is significantly reduced. So what was the crime that he... Compulsory like... prostitution. Yeah, but what is he? what did it get commuted to? I don't know. Probably, like, just minor human trafficking violations. <laughs> <laughs> minor. minor. Minor human jaywalking. I don't hey, fucking know. you forced people to be prostitutes, and we're going to cut that charge down to just a little bit of human trafficking. <laughs> just... A touch. Just a touch. Just a scooch. Um, in exchange to this reduced sentence, Luciano gives all of the information and intelligence that he can, uh, as he and the mob were basically controlling New York at this point. The other thing that the mob did for the United States government is they stopped any and all dock strikes immediately. Oh. And ensured that no dock strikes would happen for the duration of World War II. Wow. These boys kept their shit on lock. I don't know how much bribery, coercing, and or hurting that they did in order to stop the dock strikes. But if it wasn't for the mob stopping dock strikes, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have had boats for the fucking war. Yeah, probably Because this is also the time when New York is the epicenter of all the things in the United States. That's true. The cultural Much like today. hub of the world. If you read yeah. any YA novel, it still is. <laughs> yeah i don't know like i have a friend who's always like we should move to new york and i'm like man i think that that sounds great but would be terrible <laughs> yeah i mean you could you too could pay four thousand dollars for an ottoman a woman that i used to work with had a daughter who lived in new york and she told me a story once about how she like moved in to New York in her first week, she was pretty nervous about being there. And she's like, yeah. And then last week I was on the subway and a guy was taking a shit. And it's just another day in New York. And I was like, <laughs> that sounds day. like a fucking nightmare. The <laughs> only <laughs> unfortunate thing about New York is the cockroaches don't count as your roommates. Yeah, right. They and need they to start paying they don't pay rent. <laughs> yep. They need to pay rent. But Luciano uh, ends up also trying to get full executive clemency. But the government is the government, and therefore a bunch of fuckheads, and won't admit that they needed the mob's help. Yeah. To Uh. which the Manhattan's DA's office suddenly steps up because somehow they have the proof that Luciano helped and the balls to show the government came, and the government comes crawling back. (laughs) Basically, I think someone went to the DA's office and was like, if you want your wife and child to live, here's the proof, and you're going to squeeze the government. Hey, you want to have a family after this? <laughs> so, Luciano is released from prison, but he is also immediately deported back to Italy after he <laughs> hey, is released. Hey, you want to go back home? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Like, the government's like, yeah, I'll, we'll release him, but we didn't say we can't deport him either. <laughs> like, 
We'll release him, we just didn't say where. We'll release him back to Italy. It's like <laughs> releasing a, a an animal that has been recuperating back to the wild. And yeah. that animal is just then like, this isn't where I fucking live. <laughs> I live two it. blocks east. <laughs> yeah, they, they Luciano helps a bunch and then gets deported back to Italy. That's the main point. Not the yet. main um, point is that he goes back to Italy. <laughs> goes back to Italia. Um, however, yeah. Anyway, I don't know where I am. My bad. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We really had a small you. moment. Really um, long there. story. Yeah, so there is another uh, small bit that I have here. As I said, I have a couple small amalgamations, but this one is a shorter story, so I don't steal all of the time of this podcast because that would be shitty. Because this interaction with Luciano was not the first time or the last time that the government of the United States of America has come to kiss the ring. Long story Mm -hmm. short, the United States government in World War II at one point was like, fuck, we gotta invade Sicily. But also, that's a dumb as shit idea, because Sicily is heavily guarded, and also a giant island that's pretty much impenetrable. So the mob rolls up to the United States government and says, hey, let me help you out for a few favors. Hey, you want a favor? So the United States government is like, do we invade Sicily and all die, or do we get in the mob's pockets? Let's get in the mob's pockets. Again. Again. Deep, deep pockets. We'll just deny and then deport. That's what we do. (laughs) If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So the mob goes around all of New York and rounds up as many Sicilian Americans as they can. And I know that sounds a little devious and like it's going to go down a bad track. But basically all the mob does is say, hey, you're a Sicilian American. How long has it been since you've been to Sicily? Okay, can you draw me a map? And just, like, hundreds of Sicilian Americans drawing maps of Sicily. God. The Google Maps before Google. Well, that was the thing. They also were like, do you have any pictures of the coastline? And all these people were like, yeah, I got pictures of the homeland. Like, I got pictures of, like, back in Sicily. Absolutely. 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 What do you need? (sighs) Yeah, they compile all these old pictures of Sicilian coastline and maps of Sicily and are like, government, is this what you wanted? (laughs) And they're like, yes, this is perfect. The government's like, this This is great. All these, like, Sicilian Americans, as they're, like, dock workers and blue-collar workers in New York are just like, okay, so you're going to get there, take a left, go straight, two rights, and you're fucking good. <laughs> I'm going to, uh. that's how I'm going to start Google mapping things. I'm just going to, I'm going to go do it old school. Take a, take a moment from the American <laughs> government and be like, hey. Can you tell me which rock to turn at? You're just going to stop on the street, ask some random strangers, hey, do you have any Polaroids in the neighborhood? I don't know where I am. Do you have any Polaroids that I could put together on my table? Tape them together. Um, and then I have a the, the biggest inconvenient map. You can't see out of your windshield because it looks like one of those old-timey noir boards with a bunch of red string going to different places. <laughs> and it's just a map of where you're going to just get fucking Duncan's. Pe- Pepe Silvia. <laughs> Anyways. Yes. Uh, also, Vito Genovese, who is this huge Italian mob boss, also steps up to the United States government and is like, hey, you need someone to translate shit for you because you jabronis don't know a fucking lick of Italian you, and it shows. You jabronis. I, I, I spattered and, and sprinkled in so many disgusting New York Italian references into this and I'm not apologizing. Yeah, you shouldn't apologize. <laughs> I don't think, I think, think you have to. I don't think you have to. No strikes have been issued. So Vito goes to the government and is like, let me translate shit. And the government hires Vito and is like, okay, you're now our fucking guy. You're now our ambassador. Cool. Then he's like, wow, my mama would be so proud. And this mobster's like, I'm still going to do killing on the side, but I guess I can work for the government. Well, listen, you need to have a, like, like Bloomberg keeps telling everyone, they need to have side hustles in this day and age. You gotta diversify your portfolio. Yeah, dude, that's all they were doing. So Vito joining up with the government allows the joint staff planners for the 
Joint Chief of Staff's office to draft the special military plan for psychological warfare. Oh. I'm giving a pregnant pause because that sounds like a lot and it sounds aggressive. I mean, it is aggressive. But the best part about it is that name just doesn't make any sense because basically what it was was, okay, let's get some people who speak Italian to contact people in Sicily who they might know and find our way into separatist groups, pissed off blue collar Italians, and the Sicilian mob that's in Sicily so we know what the fuck's going on from the inside. I don't know where the psychological warfare of that is, but it's basically like, can we get some more information? I feel like anytime you deal with the mob, it just like automatically devolves into psychological warfare. Like it That's does fair. not matter what kind of relations you have with them. It's just like, hey, is there going to be, am I going to be sitting in this Italian restaurant and is there going to be a shootout? Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Who knows? But the fucking rigatoni's great. <laughs> the fucking pasta von Gul is delicious. <laughs> and we sat around and listened to Zach list all the pastas he knew. Honestly, <laughs> the fucking capitavi with vodka sauce is to die for. Okay, so we Have you had probably... the fucking veal? We've been doing <laughs> anyway. this for 30 minutes. We should move on to Megan's story, probably. Well... I, I was just going to lightly wrap up with oh. that scholars have debated on how effective the mob was in World War II. Um, but honestly, they sounded pretty helpful to me. Uh, and I think that it is apparent that they were helpful by the fact that Lucky Luciano was allegedly visited over 11 times while he was in prison by naval intelligence. Ooh. Hey, when you have a, when you have a, you know, an asset... You better use it, right? You fucking like, squeeze it. You yeah. buy a dinner first, but you squeeze it. Yeah, you we buy also first. learned that Zach knows an impressive amount of pasta. I do. He does know do. an impressive amount of pasta. Right. But yeah, that's my story. The mob it was essential to winning World War II for us, and uh, the mob rules. Maybe we don't end your story on the mob rules. I'm sorry. I've already kissed the ring. <laughs> You're right. He has. Um, I'm not going to kiss a ring, uh, but I'm going to... I'm going to jump into my story that really has nothing to do with the mob and it doesn't have anything to do with Ukraine really taking a sharp left turn to another part of this great world of ours. Um, As always, I will begin with the title, if that is acceptable. Oh, more than acceptable. It is encouraged. Okay. Uh, It is called The Crash at Crush, Just Cute Industry Things. Okay. I love that your titles have titles sometimes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes her titles have subtitles and it's great. It's well, like one just, isn't enough. One no. is not enough. Well, I like I'm like, why workshop them when I can just like put them all in? I'm expecting you know? one day for her title to just be a paragraph that is the introduction to her story. Uh <laughs> someday. So someday it's gonna be a title and then we're gonna get like a prologue. And like paragraph. I feel I like that's, that's more work for me. I'm trying to make them snappy. All right. So, <laughs> I, I, no, no, no. I, I know, I know. But like, I'm I see to... what Matt's saying. Like, it's got to be like Star Wars, where it's like Star Wars, and then a whole fucking paragraph oh, yeah. about what the shit's going on. Like, Has like that's title my credits. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um. So this one doesn't. I'm not there yet. So, uh, I I'd like to start by saying that I believe. Uh, under the right circumstances that humans are really innovative, um, not just with inventing new technology, but in how we advertise that technology. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Like we really love to look God in the eye and then spit in it when it comes to how far we are (laughs) willing to push the envelope as a species. Uh, Now, as we all know, I have been reading up a lot about radioactive disasters around the U S Mm-hmm. This is the first time I am telling you this, but <laughs> I I know that I have been doing this for roughly two months. But we love them half-lives. Fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> now, now, it was a well-known fact to me, but not to you. And now you know, and now we're all caught up. And knowledge is power. 
knowledge the is more you is know powerful. the more you know about my reading habits is important now the fact that i have been reading up on radiological disasters in the u.s really has nothing to do with my story other than how i found the story i'm about to tell you to begin with so uh as i was reading this book called atomic disasters in the first chapter, it talks about like during how during the Industrial Revolution, uh, while everyone was familiar with steam power, nothing was scarier to old timey people than steam boiler explosions. Um, I work in a brewery and I'm still afraid of those things. <laughs> yeah, so not only to old timey people, but also to Zach and only to Zach. Um, <laughs> an old timey person at heart. Of yeah, the three all- of us. Yeah, of all of no, I think like in general in the world, Zach's the only one who has a healthy fear of steam boiler explosions. I'd like to, I'd like to catalog that away. <laughs> Zach is the only one in the world right now. Yeah. Some people have the irrational fear of quicksand. I have the very rational fear of steam boiler explosions. Well, I will say that I yeah. thought I would encounter quicksand way more often than I did. Yep, that and like giant things of TNT that say TNT on the side. Yeah, absolutely. that's true. That's definitely true. Um, or so, dynamite. I'm sorry, but I expected to see a lot more dynamite as an adult. And it's maybe because I watched too many Looney Tunes. But I've never seen. Where's the goddamn dynamite? dynamite? Anyway. I've never seen it in my whole life. So Zach's really scared of steam boiler explosions, and so were um, the the people of industry back in the 1800s. So not only were a lot of people familiar with the utter destructive power of this event back then. Um, because it was, like, so brutal, uh, because essentially pressure will build up to the point where the boiler shell material can't contain it, and it literally, like, bursts, sending a bomb's worth of steam and debris outward. Zach knows all about this. Yes, I do. Um, I was explaining it more to to, uh, the the lay person who's listening, um, who's never heard of steam or boilers or explosions. So anyway... (laughs) <laughs> it was a loud, terrifying, and deadly event. But everything um, at the time was becoming steam-powered, including trains. And people were absolutely scared out of their minds about the possibility of a train wreck that resulted in a boiler explosion. If you survived the initial derailment or crash, you probably wouldn't survive the bomb, um, which made riding the train uh, a little scary. You know, Just a little. A little. Well, it made it a little spicy, because you didn't know if you were going to get out. Hey, guys, I'm going to get on this train. There's a chance that I don't survive the encounter. Wish me luck! (laughs) (laughs) This train ride will cost the equivalent of $114 in 2022 money. Anyway, um... However, people in the 1800s needed to use trains if they wanted to get anywhere in a reasonable amount of time, and train companies wanted people to use the trains because that's how they made money. So the uh, Missouri-Kansas-Texas Railroad, uh, I don't know why they needed to put all three fucking states in their name and couldn't just name this something snappy like Amazon Railroad or something. Um, (laughs) Don't let the corporations in on this. Don't let the corporations in on this. Well, anyway, this railroad, uh, they, they came up with a plan, a business plan, if you will. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a plan for business. A plan, plan. for business. They, because they were businessmen. They were businessmen. They were business boys. We should probably tell the story. Yeah. Probably yeah. So they, what they were gonna do in this plan is they were going to crash some motherfucking trains. And as <laughs> I'm sure you're wondering, why the fuck would they do this? The answer was to show people just how bad it could get. <laughs> so this See, I dude, was going the opposite of being like, let's make this trade fucking bulletproof. No, 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 no. They're like, what if we show people hell so they'll be less scared of hell? Uh, so one of their workers or like their executives, it's sort of unclear who this man was, um, but his name was William Crush. He was an agent of the railroad. He argued that this publicity stunt um, would that would make use of like some obsolete trains that were sitting around. Um, if they crashed them together, it would alleviate people's fears of train crashes. Uh, <laughs> I guess. 
I guess. I love the idea. Like, it's really just the concept of, like, fighting fire with fire. But it's like, let's combat people's fear of train crashes by causing more train crashes. Yeah. But like... it's even better because this man's name is Crash. And he's like, what if we crashed it? Yeah. Well, his name was Crush. <laughs> Oh, Crush. I don't, you know what? He's like, I'm Crush and we're going to crash. Fuck yeah, let's do this. Yeah, the, Mr. Crush, what are we going to do? He's like, okay, no, crush fuck. the trains. Now it's just, now it's just the sea turtle from Finding Nemo being like, <laughs> we're going to take some trains and we're going to let them ride those rails until they smash. Okay, I love, I love what you're doing, Zach, but you also sound like George Bush. <laughs> Only a little bit. You also Fuck. Sound, you sound like a hippie version of George Bush wanting to crash trains, which is a really interesting juxtaposition. Of we got to say it down in Texas. <laughs> Fool me once. <laughs> Fool me once. Shame Fool on me can't get shame yeah, on the shame trains. On can't fooled again. Can't get fooled again after you crash these trains. Fool me uh, twice. Shame on trains. So they. They thought that their fears would be alleviated. Um, so the plan went as follows. Mm -hmm. a, a temporary track was built 14 miles north of Waco, Texas. Waco, Waco? Texas. Waco? Waco, Waco. I don't Also Waco, know. understandable. Tomato, tomato. Yeah, tomato, tomato. Am I right, guys? <laughs> 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 so it's Waco, Texas, as the, as the jury is now telling me. Um... Along the Dallas-Houston train route. Uh, the event was free of charge, and the railroad profited from the sale of train tickets that they ran at a discounted rate from anywhere in the U.S. So a round-trip ticket um, in, in like, 18, 1850 cost about $3.50, which meant that in today's clams, it would be $114. That's a lot of clams. Uh, it's a lot of clams, uh, but discounted clams, so sexy. Uh, a circus tent was erected on the site, as was a grandstand, a telegraph office, a special um, a special depot for the trains. To This is where the trains sleep. Um, and carnival shows. It was like a big county fair, essentially, where like the, the main event happened to be a train crash. <laughs> um, I mean... I grew up in New Hampshire, and, you know, we watched demolition derbies, so I can understand this. Yeah, you get it. You you get what they were doing. Uh, so, on the day of the show, engineers said, engineers with maybe degrees. I don't know what engineers needed back in the day to be considered engineers. Um, they weren't conductors, and that's all we know. Yeah, hopefully it was a de degree. I don't know. So, anyway... The engineers said that this was safe and that the boilers definitely, probably, wouldn't explode, even Maybe. in a high-speed crash. <laughs> and the spectators, which numbered around 40,000, would only be allowed within 100 yards, because that's far enough away. Only one football field away from a gigantic possible, but probably not, explosion. <laughs> yeah, probably not, right? So the crash was delayed by an hour because the crowd wanted to get closer. They wanted to see it. They wanted Idiots. to. They wanted to smell it. At about 5 p.m., the two trains pulling their six box cars behind them started rolling towards their starting points. Uh, the engineers that were driving the trains opened um, opened up the engine to their prearranged settings and jumped out after four turns of the wheels. So they like they fucking dove off. They bailed. Uh, and they let nature take its course, now, as God as Megan, God intended. I yeah. need to ask you a question. Yes, please. You said the sentence "they bailed" as if you expected them to stay <laughs> on these trains as Better they were die, crashing bitches. into each other, as if know. they were meant to go down with the ship that they yeah. very blatantly crashed into the iceberg themselves. <laughs> yeah. You also just, said that it would, took its natural course, but I just, think what you meant was. They did the hubris of humans and decided to dram like ram metal into just gigantic things. Yeah, just like in nature, just like in trains and their natural habitat do. The hubris of man. Listen, when you see two trains out in the wild, they compete for mates by crashing into <laughs> each other. Um, 
This is I'm... how the male presents to the female. Passing <laughs> two trains into each other at full steam. Yeah. David Attenborough told me this, um, and I believe him. We see now a male in the wild. I he wish is I could a train. do a good Attenborough voice. We oh, see a male yes. in the wild. He is a train. The other male also a train. We see a male train, train. <laughs> coming up to ram forward. Like this... it's a fucking caterpillar. <laughs> this is a display given for mating rituals. <laughs> that was pretty good. That was a good David it's Attenborough It's the best I got. Version. Yeah, I mean, like, it's hard. I'm I didn't sorry, try. Sir David Attenborough. I tried. <laughs> I'm sorry, National Treasure. David Attenborough. In- international treasure international uh, treasure so they they didn't go down with the ship these conductors did leave like cowards um so each train was only expected to hit like 45 miles per hour but they ended <laughs> up going a lot faster i saw that coming <laughs> and when they finally hit their boilers fucking ruptured oh no <laughs> like, shit and debris was blown hundreds of feet in the air and tore through the first line of spectators, killing two oh and God. seriously injuring. I forgot that there were spectators. <laughs> how do you forget there's 40,000 people? I don't know how I forgot that there were spectators, but I think it's... I like zoned out and zoned in so quickly that spectators wasn't even on my radar. <laughs> yeah, so... Fucking tore through the crowd, dude. They forgot that there were spectators and that this was a bad idea. Yeah, well, you know, money's money, am I right, dog? Ugh. So it's like a reporter lost an eye, um, and a child was split in twain. Oh, a child? <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, I'm sorry. They were in just twain. fucking they were cleaved He's in half. He's rubbing that rowing twice. <laughs> yep. Yeah, just picture that, but a child. He split um, that child in twice. I hate the trains. Uh, so when the scraps of hot metal hit the ground, uh-huh. um, the spectators that we've forgotten about, they surged forward because they wanted the pieces. They like oh, magpies. No. They they How wanted stupid the do you hot get? pieces. I mean, but I will say, at least if you lost a finger or two, if it's hot metal, at least you're cauterizing the wound right it's away. It's true. They were any any damages that they did to themselves uh, was sterilized immediately. <laughs> um, so we can thank God for that. Uh, the story made national headlines, even though it, it wasn't the first of the events. Like, there had been other staged train crashes, because I bet you didn't know. That was a fun thing that we did. Um, it was just the deadliest. However, despite the negative publicity, uh, William Crush, the architect behind this amazing plan, um, he was fired he oh. they were just like hey hey william crush this this might have been a bad idea on on the part of the railroad um but <laughs> and they made like a big story about firing him but then he was secretly hot rehired the next day and he continued <laughs> to work for the company until his retirement so, oh, so there like were... a lot of the cops that shoot black people yeah yeah they just moved him around uh, or the, you know uh, or the catholic, catholic priests. priests that touch little yep. kids yeah, yep. you are exactly right. All of those things are equivalent to train crashes. Uh, the The railroad settled their lawsuits with the families, and the they profited enormously from the fame of the crash. And other companies then went on to stage their own crashes, with some of the last going off around the 1930s. So, On that last se- statement, once again, all I can say is, the hubris of man. The hubris Jeez. of man, really. I So, I thought it was just, like, an interesting story because, like, again, I found it at the beginning of that um, Atomic Disasters book, and they were talking about it because they were, like, a lot of people are scared of radio activity and, like, nuclear power because, like, they aren't exactly sure how bad it can get and, like... 
we had these similar problems like back when steam boilers would go off and like trains were new like people just didn't know how bad it could get um and i get what the author was saying but like trains aren't radioactive like steam isn't radioactive yeah but not only that but i feel like my sentiment is and they're like, we don't know how bad this can be, but we're here to assure you, it can be real fucking bad. <laughs> yeah, we're here to assure you, it can get real fucking hey, bad, brother. in case you guys were worried that it couldn't get bad, we're here to let you know, it could for sure. It could, for show sure get so bad. Okay, you gotta stop. You gotta, we gotta stop. stop. We gotta stop. But yeah, it... I just thought it was a funny story. I mean, minus the that child. That is a pretty funny story, minus a child being ripped in half. Ripped yeah. in half, but, like, yeah. It's, I can watch um, kids falling off bikes. I can't watch kids <laughs> fucking getting ripped in half. The way that it was described in the book was, like, the kid was sitting on a tree branch to get a better look. Oh. oh he regrets that tree branch now, bless his little well, heart. He didn't have he didn't have time to regret anything, if we're being honest. I don't yeah. know how my brain tuned out the fact that there were spectators, but like There's as, so soon many as, you, spectators. as soon as you said it again, I was just like, oh shit, that's right. Yeah. Oh yeah, there was about 40,000 people watching this. Crazy. Crazy. There's so many stuff. people! Yeah, it was a lot of people. Um, There is, I believe there is a... There's not a town, but there is a, um, there's like a marker in okay. the area being like... You know, this is where the crash at Crush happened. We did dumb shit here. We Here's did dumb marker. shit here. Here's a marker. But that's my story. Thank you for listening. All right, guys. Uh, we've been talking for a good amount of time. This episode was really hard to keep on the rails. I tried my best as the podcast ad, but sometimes... Is that a just... railroad joke? <laughs> it's certainly not one that'll split a kid in half. Um, wow. That being said... uh. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna take off and i um, will before we take off oh i just want to say some stuff okay say some hold stuff. up all right first off um if you don't follow us on our socials you should do that because we like interacting with our uh fans here and we've had some i we've had some wonderful conversation with some people who listen um That's and it's really cool to like get people's opinions and how they like the show oh yeah like uh Zoe was saying that we should start telling stories about Nero because we haven't yet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But if you don't follow us on our socials, you can follow us on our socials. Socials, and you should follow us on our socials. Uh, you can find us at triumvirate underscore pod on Twitter, and you can find us at the underscore triumvirate underscore productions on instagram and if you go to either of those and you go to the profile there's a fun little link tree that takes you to all of our socials so you can follow us on everything um and, and you by the better and you better and this is uh, and by the threat. time this episode airs our patreon will also probably be up and running i Thank say that in hopes and like oh my gosh i hope so uh, so if you search the Triumvirate Productions on Patreon, you can find us there. We have three tiers, uh, one, two, and three strikes. Uh, and, you know, tier one is just being really nice and supporting us. Tier two, you get our exclusive What the Fuck After Dark. So you can hear all the shenanigans we do before and after the show. Um, but yeah, thank you to everyone who does listen because you guys are awesome and we really love the support. So if you do follow us or don't follow us, you should follow us. And that's my main point. Yeah. All right. And with that, I leave you with this final question. What the fuck, history? <laughs> <laughs>